with the old breed, disc 12. We started off in high spirits for what we thought would be an interesting jaunt into the area south of the Aruku Peninsula. We had gotten cleaned up by then. Our dungarees had been washed, and our leggings and boondockers were dry and scraped clean of mud. We carried the usual two canteens of water. We also had ration chocolate bars because we would be gone several hours and could eat those on the move. My buddy was armed with a carbine. I carried the Tommy and my forty-five pistol. The weather had dried out, and it was an ideal day for a little harmless diversion from the patrols we had been making. After we moved out of our battalion area and onto the road, we saw almost no one. As we walked along the silent road, the only sounds in our immediate surroundings were our own voices, the crunching of our boondockers on the road, the muffled sloshing of the water in our canteens, and the occasional thump of our weapons' stocks against our canteens or K-bar scabbards. We moved in that silent world that characterized the backwash of battle. The area was replete with the flotsam of war. The storm front had passed, but its wreckage was left behind. Our experienced eyes read the silent signs and reconstructed the drama and pathos of various life-and-death struggles that had occurred. We encountered numerous enemy corpses, which we always passed on the windward side. We saw no marine dead, but a bloody dungaree jacket here, a torn boondocker there, a helmet with the camouflage cloth cover and steel beneath, ripped by bullets, discarded plasma bottles and bloody battle dressings gave mute testimony of the fate of their former owners. We passed through an embankment for a railroad track and entered the outskirts of a town. All buildings were badly damaged, but some were still standing. We stopped briefly to explore a quaint little store. Displayed in its window were various cosmetics. In the street in front of the store lay a corpse clad in a blue kimono. Someone had placed a broken door over the pathetic body. We speculated he had been the proprietor of the little shop. We passed a burned-out bus station with the ticket booth still standing in front. To our right and distant, the battle rumbled and rattled as the 6th Marine Division fought the enemy on the Oroku Peninsula. Without incident, we continued through the ruins toward the beach when an Amtrak came rattling toward us. The driver was the first living soul we had seen. We hailed him, and it turned out he was expecting us at the beach, but had started along the road hoping to locate us. After receiving the information about our unit, he spun his Amtrak around and headed back toward the beach. With our mission completed, my buddy and I started back along the road through the ruins. We passed the little cosmetic shop and the dead Okinawan covered by the door, and approached the bus station on our left. A gentle breeze was blowing. Only the clanking of a piece of loose tin on the ruined bus station roof broke the silence. If I blotted out the distant rumble of battle, our surroundings reminded me of walking past some deserted farm building on a peaceful spring afternoon back home. It seemed like an interesting place to take ten, explore the bus station, and eat our ration bars. We had saved time by meeting the Amtrak, so we could stop for a while. The harsh snapping and cracking of a long burst of Japanese machine gun bullets zipping chest high in front of us sent my buddy and me scrambling for cover. We dove behind the concrete ticket booth and lay on the rubble-strewn concrete, breathing hard. God, that was close, Sledgehammer! too damn close. The enemy gunner had been zeroed in perfectly on his elevation, but he had led us too much. The bullets ricocheted and whined around inside the burned-out bus station. We heard the tinkle of glass as the slugs broke windows among the burned-out buses. "'Where the hell is that bastard?' asked my buddy. "'I don't know, but it's probably a couple of hundred yards away from the sound of the gun.' We lay motionless for a moment, 
the silence interrupted only by the peaceful, lazy clanking of the tin in the breeze. Cautiously, I peered out from behind the base of the ticket booth. Another burst of slugs narrowly missed my head and went clattering through the building after striking the concrete alongside us. That bastard zeroed in on us for sure, groaned my buddy. The ticket booth in front of the building was surrounded by an open expanse of concrete in all directions. The gunner had us pinned down tightly. My buddy peeped around his side of the narrow booth and got the same reception as I had. The enemy machine gunner then fired a burst across the top of the concrete portion of the booth, shattering what was left of the windows in the upper part of the booth. We were sure that the Nambu gunner was up on the south side of the railroad embankment. Maybe we can get back among them buses and out of sight and then slip out of the rear of the building, my buddy said. He moved slightly to one side to look behind us, but another burst of fire proved his plan faulty. I guess we'll have to wait it out till dark and then slip out of here, I said. Guess you're right. We sure as hell ain't going to get out of here during the daylight without getting hit. He's got us pinned down tight. Sledgehammer, after all the crap we've been through, damned if we ain't between a rock and the hard place. God damn it to hell. The minutes grew into lonely hours as time dragged by. We kept a sharp lookout in all directions in case other Japanese might slip in behind us while we were occupied by the machine gun. Toward late afternoon, we heard a burst of M1 rifle fire over in the direction where the enemy gunner was located. After a few minutes, we peeped out. To our delight, we saw a group of four or five Company K Marines striding along the road from the direction of the road cut. Look out for that Nambu, we yelled, pointing back toward where the fire had been coming from. A grinning Marine held up the machine gun and yelled, Rack em up! You guys okay? The gunny figured you'd run into trouble when you didn't come back and sent us out to look for you. By mid-June, familiar faces were scarce in Company K and in all the infantry units of the 1st Marine Division. On one June, the company lost 36 men to enemy action. Ten days later, 22 men left with immersion foot and other severe illnesses. Despite mid-month replacements, Company K moved toward its final major fight with about 100 men and two or three officers, only half of whom had landed at Higushi two and a half months earlier. Carnage on Kunishi Ridge Toward the middle of June, we began to hear disturbing rumors about a place south of us called Kunishi Ridge. Rumors circulated that our division's other infantry regiments, the 7th Marines and later the 1st Marines, were involved in bitter fighting there and would need our help. Our hopes began to fade that the 5th Marines wouldn't be committed to the front lines again. We continued our patrols. I enjoyed my canned Japanese scallops and hoped there was no such place as Kunishi Ridge. But the inevitable day came with the order, Square away your gear, we're moving out again. The weather turned dry and warm as we moved south. The farther we proceeded, the louder the sound of firing became. The bumping of artillery, the thudding of mortars, the incessant rattle of machine guns, the popping of rifles. It was a familiar combination of noise, that engendered the old feelings of dread about one's own chances, as well as the horrible images of the wounded, the shocked, and the dead, the inevitable harvest. Following the retreat from Shuri, the Japanese defenders of Okinawa withdrew into their final defensive lines along a string of ridges near the southern end of the island. The western anchor was Kunishi Ridge. In the middle, was Yuzadake. Further east was Yezudake. Dake means hill in Japanese. Kunishi Ridge was about 1,500 yards long, a sheer coral escarpment. 
The Japanese dug into caves and emplacements on its forward and reverse slopes. The northern frontal approaches to Kanishi lay wide open. Flat grasslands and rice paddies, across which the Japanese had perfect fields of fire. On 12 June, the 7th Marines made a pre-dawn attack and captured a portion of Kanishi. The Marines were on the ridge, but the enemy was in it. For four days, the Marines of the 7th Regiment were isolated atop the ridge. Airdrops and tanks supplied them, and tanks removed their dead and wounded. On 14 June, the 1st Marines attacked portions of Kunishi and suffered heavy losses for their efforts. On the same day, the 1st Battalion, led by Lt. Col. Austin Schaffner, former CEO of 3-5 on Peleliu, attacked and captured Yuzadake, but suffered terrible casualties from the Japanese defenders there and from intense fire sent over from Yezudake. Into the hellish confusion we went on 14 June, with the word still ringing in our ears, the 5th Marines may not be committed again. We plodded along the sides of a dusty road, next to tanks and Amtraks, moving forward, and a steady stream of ambulance jeeps returning, loaded with the youthful human wreckage of the battle for Kunishi Ridge. That afternoon, our company deployed along a row of trees and bushes on the south side of the road. We saw and heard heavy firing on Kunishi Ridge across the open ground ahead. My mortar section dug in near the road with our guns adjusted to fire flares over a picturesque bridge that remained intact over a high stream bank. A couple of us went to look at the bridge before dark. We walked down to the stream on a trail leading from the road. The water was crystal clear and made a peaceful gurgling sound over a clean, pebbly bottom. Ferns grew from the overhanging mossy banks and between rocks on both sides. I had the urge to look for salamanders and crayfish. It was a beautiful place, cool and peaceful, so out of context with the screaming hell close above it. The next morning we relieved 1-1 one -one on Yuzadake. As we moved up along a road, we passed a small tree with all the limbs blasted off. So many communication wires hung from it at all angles that it looked like a big inverted mop. A ricocheting bullet whined between me and the man in front of me. It raised a little dust cloud as it smashed into a pile of dry brush by the roadside. Back into the meat grinder again, I thought, as we moved up toward the sound of heavy firing. Yuzadake looked terrible to me. It resembled one of the hellish coral ridges on Peleliu. We could see Kanishi Ridge on our right and the Yezudake escarpment on our left. Army tanks were moving against the latter, while machine guns and 75-millimeter cannons hammered away. For the first time in combat, I heard the wailing of sirens. We were told that the army had put sirens on their tanks for the psychological effect it might have on the Japanese. To me, the sirens just made the whole bloody struggle more bizarre and unnerving. The Japanese rarely surrendered in the face of flamethrowers, artillery, bombs, or anything else, so I didn't understand how harmless sirens would bother them. We got mighty tired of hearing them wailing against the constant rattle of small arms and the crash of shell fire. While we were on Yuzadake, under sporadic enemy fire, 2-5 joined the 7th Marines in the bitter fighting to capture the rest of Kunishi Ridge. The Japanese emplacements and caves received terrific bombardment by mortars, artillery, heavy naval gunfire, and airstrikes, consisting of 25 to 30 planes. It reminded me more and more of Bloody Nose Ridge on Peleliu. The 2nd Battalion, 5th Marines, gained some ground on Kunishi, but needed help. Company K was attached to 2-5 and arrived just in time to help that battalion fight off a company-sized night counterattack on 17 June. Later that night, 
we heard that our company would attack the next morning to seize the remainder of Kunishi Ridge in the 5th Marine Zone of Action. Once again, we would enter the abyss of close combat. We learned that we would move out well before daylight and deploy for the attack, because we had to move across a wide open area to get to the ridge. An officer came along giving us what sounded like a pep talk about how the 5th Marines could finish the job on Kunishi Ridge. We all knew that the 1st Marines and the 7th Marines had already been terribly shot up, taking most of the ridge. Moving in the darkness was something the old salts of Gloucester and Peleliu didn't like at all. We were stubborn in our belief that nobody but the Japanese, or damned fools, moved around at night. The new replacements who had come into the company a few days before seemed so pitifully confused they didn't know the difference. But moving up under cover of darkness was the only sane way to approach Kunishi Ridge. The 1st Marines and the 7th Marines had already found it necessary to move that way to get across the open ground without being slaughtered. We moved slowly and cautiously across dry rice paddies and cane fields. Up ahead we saw shells exploding on and around the ridge as our artillery swished overhead. We heard the familiar popping of rifles, rattle of machine guns, and banging of grenades. Enemy shells also exploded on the ridge. We all knew that this was probably the last big fight before the Japanese were wiped out and the campaign ended. While I plodded along through the darkness, my heart pounding, my throat dry, and almost too tight to swallow, near panic seized me. Having made it that far in the war, I knew my luck would run out. I began to sweat and pray that when I got hit, it wouldn't result in death or maiming. I wanted to turn and run away. We came closer to the ridge silhouetted against the skyline. Its crest looked so much like bloody nose that my knees nearly buckled. I felt as though I were on Peleliu and had it all to go through again. The riflemen moved up onto the ridge. We mortar men were positioned to watch out for Japanese infiltrating from the left rear. We didn't set up our weapons. The fighting was so close in with the enemy on the reverse slope and in the ridge that we couldn't fire high explosives. Our 105 millimeter artillery was firing over Kunishi Ridge while we moved into position in the dark. To our dismay, a shell exploded short in our company's line. The company CP alerted the artillery observers that we had received short rounds. Another 105 went off with a terrible flash and explosion. Corman! someone yelled. God damn it, we're getting casualties from short rounds! an officer yelled into his walkie-talkie. What's the word on those short rounds? the company executive officer asked. Says they'll check it out. Our artillery was firing across the ridge into and around the town of Kunishi to prevent the enemy from moving more troops onto the ridge. But each time they shot, it seemed that one gun fired its shells in a traversing pattern right along the ridge in Company K's lines. It was enough to drive anyone into a state of desperation. The Japanese were throwing grenades all along the line, and there was some rifle and machine gun fire. On the right we began to hear American grenades exploding well within our lines. Hey, you guys, Nips must have gotten hold of a box of our grenades. Listen to that, would you? Yeah, them bastards will use anything they can get their hands on. During the next flurry of grenades, we heard no more U.S. models explode within our area. Then the word came along in the dark to be sure all the new replacements knew exactly how to use grenades properly. One of our new men had been discovered removing each grenade canister from a box of grenades, pulling the sealing tape from the canister, and then throwing the unopened canister at the enemy. The Japanese opened each canister, took out the grenade, pulled the pin, and threw the deadly pineapple back at us. The veterans around me were amazed to find out what had happened. 
The incident, however, was just one of many examples of the poor state of combat readiness of the latest group of new replacements. With daylight, I got a good look at our surroundings. Only then could I appreciate fully what a desperate, bitter battle the fight for Kunishi Ridge had been, and was continuing to be. The ridge was coral rock, painfully similar to Peleliu's ridges. But Kunishi was not so high, nor were the coral formations so jagged and angular as those on Peleliu. Our immediate area was littered with the usual debris of battle, including about thirty poncho-covered dead marines on stretchers. Some of our riflemen moved eastward along the ridge, while others moved up the slopes. We still didn't set up our mortars. It was strictly a rifleman's fight. We mortar men stood by to act as stretcher bearers or riflemen. Snipers were all over the ridge and almost impossible to locate. Men began getting shot one right after another, and the stretcher teams kept on the run. We brought the casualties down to the base of the ridge to a point where tanks could back in out of the view of snipers on the ridge crest. We tied the wounded onto the stretchers and then tied the stretchers onto the rear deck of the tanks. Walking wounded went inside. Then the tanks took off in a cloud of dust along a coral road to the aid station. As many men as possible fired along the ridge to pin down the snipers so they couldn't shoot the wounded on the tanks. Shortly before the company reached the east end of the ridge, we watched a stretcher team make its way up to bring down a casualty. Suddenly, four or five mortar shells exploded in quick succession near the team, wounding slightly three of the four bearers. They helped each other back down the ridge, and another stretcher team, of which I was a member, started up to get the casualty. To avoid the enemy mortar observer, we moved up by a slightly different route. We got up the ridge and found the casualty lying above a sheer coral ledge about five feet high. The Marine... Leonard E. Vargo told us he couldn't move much because he had been shot in both feet. Thus he couldn't lower himself down off the ledge. You guys be careful. The nip that shot me twice is still hiding right over there in those rocks. He motioned toward a jumble of boulders not more than twenty yards away. We reasoned that if the sniper had been able to shoot Vargo in both feet, immobilizing him, he was probably waiting to snipe at anyone who came to the rescue. That meant that anyone who climbed up to help Vargo down would get shot instantly. We stood against the coral rock with our heads about level with Vargo, but out of the line of fire of the sniper, and looked at each other. I found the silence embarrassing. Vargo lay patiently, confident of our aid. Somebody's got to get up there and hand him down. I said. My three buddies nodded solemnly and made quiet comments in agreement. I thought to myself that if we fooled around much longer, the sniper might shoot and kill the already painfully wounded and helpless Marine. Then we heard the crash of another 105 millimeter short round farther along the ridge, then another. I was seized with a grim fatalism. It was either be shot by the sniper or have all of us get blown to bits by our own artillery. Feeling ashamed for hesitating so long, I scrambled up beside Vargo. Watch out for that nip, he said again. As I placed my hands under his shoulders, I glanced over and saw the entrance of the sniper's small cave. It was a black space about three feet in diameter. I expected to see a muzzle flash spurt forth. Strangely, I felt at peace with myself, and oddly, wasn't particularly afraid. But there was no sound or sight of the sniper. My buddies had Vargo well in hand by then, so for a brief instant I stood up and looked south. I felt a sensation of wild exhilaration. Beyond the smoke of our artillery to the south lay the end of the island and the end of the agony. Come on, sledgehammer, let's move out. With another quick glance at the mouth of the small cave, puzzled over where the sniper was and why he hadn't fired at me, I scrambled back down the rock to the stretcher team. 
we carried Vargo down Kunishi Ridge without further incident. After bringing down another casualty, I passed our company CP among some rocks at the foot of the ridge and overheard one of our officers talking confidentially to Hank Boys. The officer said his nerves were almost shattered by the constant strain, and he didn't think he could carry on much longer. The veteran boys talked quietly, trying to calm the officer. The officer sat on his helmet, frantically running his hands through his hair. He was almost sobbing. I felt compassion for the officer. I'd been in the same forlorn frame of mind more than once, when horror piled on horror seemed too much to bear. The officer also carried a heavy responsibility, which I didn't have. As I walked past, the officer blurted out in desperation, "'What's the matter with those guys up on the ridge? Why the hell don't they move out faster and get this thing over with?' Compassion aside, my own emotional and physical state was far from good by then. Completely forgetting my lowly rank, I walked right into the CP and said to the officer, I'll tell you what's the matter with those guys on the ridge. They're getting shot right and left, and they can't move any faster. He looked up with a dazed expression. Boys turned around, probably expecting to see the battalion or regimental commander. When he saw me instead, he looked surprised. Then he glared at me the way he did the time I had too much to say to Shadow back on Half Moon. Coming quickly to my senses and remembering that a private's advice to first lieutenants and gunny sergeants wasn't considered standard operating procedure in the Marine Corps, I backed away quietly and got out of there. Toward afternoon, several of us were resting among some rocks near the crest of the ridge, we had been passing ammo and water up to some men just below the crest. A Japanese machine gun still covered the crest there, and no one dared raise his head. Bullets snapped over the crest, and ricochets whined off into the air after striking rocks. The man next to me was a rifleman and a fine Peleliu veteran whom I knew well. He had become unusually quiet and moody during the past hour but I just assumed he was as tired and as weary with fear and fatigue as I was. Suddenly, he began babbling incoherently, grabbed his rifle, and shouted, "'Those slant-eyed yellow bastards! They've killed enough of my buddies! I'm going after them. He jumped up and started for the crest of the ridge. "'Stop!' I yelled, and grabbed at his trouser leg. He pulled away, a sergeant next to him yelled, Stop, you fool! The sergeant also grabbed for the frantic man's legs, but his hands slipped. He managed to clutch the toe of one boondocker, however, and gave a jerk. That threw the man off balance, and he sprawled on his back, sobbing like a baby. The front of his trousers was darkened where he had urinated when he lost control of himself. The sergeant and I tried to calm him, but also made sure he couldn't get back onto his feet. Take it easy, Cobber. We'll get you out of here, the NCO said. We called a corpsman who took the sobbing, trembling man out of the meat grinder to an aid station. He's a damn good Marine, Sledgehammer. I'll lower the boom on anybody who says he ain't. But he just had all he can take, that's it. He's just had all he can take. The sergeant's voice trailed away sadly. We had just seen a brave man crack up completely and lose all control of himself, even to the point of losing his desire to live. If he hadn't grabbed his foot and jerked him down before he got to the crest, he'd be dead now for sure, I said. Yeah, the poor guy would have gotten hit by that goddamn machine gun, no doubt about it, the sergeant said. By the end of the day, Company K reached the eastern end of Kunishi Ridge and established contact with army units that had gained the high ground on Yuzudake and Yezudake. Mail came up to us along with rations, water, and ammo. Among my letters was one from a Mobile acquaintance of many years. He had joined the Marine Corps and was a member of some rear echelon unit of service troops stationed on northern Okinawa. He insisted that I write him immediately about the location of my unit. 
He wrote that when he found out where I was, he would visit me at once. I read his words to some of my buddies, and they got a good laugh out of it. Don't that guy know there's a war on? The hell does he think the 1st Marine Division is doing down here anyway? Someone else suggested I insist not only that he come to see me at once, but that he stay and be my replacement if he wanted to be a true friend. I never answered the letter. A small patrol from the 7th Marines came by, and we talked with an old buddy. He said his regiment had been in terrible fighting for the several days it had been on Kunishi Ridge. Then we sat silently, ruefully watching a group of Marines far over to the right get shelled by large-caliber Japanese artillery. Word came along the line about the death earlier in the day of the U.S. 10th Commander, General Buckner. General Simon Bolivar Buckner, USA, had come up to the front lines to watch the 8th Marine Regiment, 2nd Marine Division, in its first combat action on Okinawa. He was observing from between two coral boulders when six Japanese 47-millimeter artillery rounds struck the base of the rocks. Hit in the chest, he died shortly thereafter. Lieutenant General Roy S. Geiger, USMC 3rd Amphibious Corps commander, took command of the 10th Army and carried through to the end of the fighting a few days later. To this date, in 1981, Geiger remains the only Marine officer to command a force of Army size. Not long after we were relieved on Kunishi Ridge, in the afternoon of 18 June, I asked Gunnery Sergeant Hank Boys how many men we had lost fighting on Yuzadaka and Kunishi. He told me Company K had lost 49 enlisted men and one officer, half of our number of the previous day. Almost all the newly arrived replacements were among the casualties. Now the company consisted of a mere remnant, 21% of its normal strength of 235 men. We had been attached to 2-5 for only 22 hours and had been on Kunishi Ridge for less time than that. Chapter 15 End of the Agony from 11 to 18 June, the fierce battle for the Kunishi Yuza Yeju escarpment cost the 1st Marine Division 1,150 casualties. The fight marked the end of organized Japanese resistance on Okinawa. The battle for the Kunishi escarpment was unforgettable. It reminded many of us of Peleliu's ridges and we still weren't used to the fact that night attacks by Marines had played a significant role in capturing the difficult objective. Among my friends in the ranks, the biggest surprise was the poor state of readiness and training of our newest Marine replacements, as compared to the more efficient replacements who had come into the company earlier in the campaign. They had received some combat training in the rear areas before joining us. But most of the new men who joined us just before Kunishi Ridge had come straight from the States. Some of them told us they had had only a few weeks' training, or less, after boot camp. It's no wonder they were so confused and ineffective when first exposed to intense enemy fire. When we had to evacuate a casualty under fire, some of the new men were reluctant to take the chances necessary to save the wounded Marine. This reticence infuriated the veterans, who made such threats against them, that the new men finally did their share. They were motivated by greater fear of the veteran Marines than of the Japanese. This isn't to reflect on their bravery. They simply weren't trained and conditioned properly to cope with the shock, violence, and hellish conditions into which they were thrown. The rank and file, usually sympathetic toward new replacements, simply referred to them as fouled up as Hogan's goat, or some other more profound but profane description. With a feeling of intense relief, we came down off Kunishi Ridge late in the day of 18 June. 
After rejoining the other companies of 3-5, we moved in column on a road cut through the ridge. As we wound south, we talked with men of the 8th Marines who were moving along the road with us. We were glad to see a veteran Marine regiment come in to spearhead the final push south. We were exhausted. The veterans in our ranks scrutinized the men of the 8th Marines with that hard professional stare of old salts sizing up another outfit. Everything we saw brought forth remarks of approval. They looked squared away, and many of them were combat veterans themselves. The 8th Marines came up from Saipan to reinforce the 1st Marine Division in the final drive on Okinawa. Among the many streamers on its regimental battle color flew one for Tarawa. I talked to a 60-millimeter mortarman who was carrying almost an entire clover leaf of H.E. shells on a backpack rig. Asking why he was so overloaded, I was told his battalion commander wanted the mortarmen to try the arrangement because they could carry more ammo than in a regular ammo bag. I hoped fervently that none of our officers saw that rig. I also saw a machine gun squad with Nip Nemesis stenciled neatly on the water jacket of their thirty caliber heavy machine gun. They were a sharp-looking crew. We passed a large muddy area in the road cut. In it lay the body of a dead Japanese soldier in full uniform and equipment. It was a bizarre sight. He had been mashed down into the mud by tank treads and looked like a giant squashed insect. Our column moved down into a valley at five pace intervals, one file on each side of the road. An Amtrak came clattering slowly along, headed toward the front farther south. It passed me as I was daydreaming about the delightful possibility that we might not get shelled or shot at anymore. But my reverie was terminated rudely and abruptly by whiz bang. Whiz! Bang! Disperse! Someone yelled. We scattered like a covey of quail. About ten of us jumped into a shallow ditch. The first enemy anti-tank shell had passed over the top of the Amtrak and exploded in a field beyond. But the second shell scored a direct hit on the left side of the Amtrak. The machine jolted to a stop and began smoking. We peeped out of the ditch as the driver tried to start the engine. The crewman peered back into the cargo compartment to assess the damage. Two more shells slammed into the side of the disabled Amtrak. The two Marines in the cab jumped out, ran over, and flopped down, panting into the ditch near us. "'What kind of cargo is in there?' I asked. "'We got a full unit of fire for a rifle company.' Thirty ball, grenades, mortar ammo, the works. Boy, she is going to blow like hell when that fire gets to that ammo. The gas tanks are hit so bad there's no way to put it out. The driver crawled off along the ditch to find a radio man to report that his load of ammo couldn't get through to the front. Just then a man crawled over next to me and stood upright. I looked up at him in surprise. Every Marine in the area was hugging the deck, waiting for the inevitable explosion from the Amtrak. The man was clad in clean dungarees with the new sheen still on the cloth, and he displayed the relaxed appearance of a person who could wash up and drink hot coffee at a CP whenever he was in the mood to do so. He carried a portable movie camera with which he began avidly filming the pillow of thick black smoke boiling up from the Amtrak. Rifle cartridges began popping in the Amtrak as the heat got to them. "'Hey, mate,' I said. "'You better get down. That thing is going to blow sky high any minute. It's loaded with ammo.' The man held his camera steady, but stopped filming. He turned and looked down at me with a contemptuous stare of utter disdain and disgust. He didn't demean himself to speak to me as I cringed in the ditch, but turned back to his camera eyepiece and continued filming. At that moment came a flash, accompanied by a loud explosion and terrific concussion as the Amtrak blew up. The concussion knocked the cameraman completely off his feet. 
He was uninjured, but badly shaken and terribly frightened. He peered, wide-eyed and cautious, over the ditch bank at the twisted Amtrak burning on the road. I leaned over to him and said pleasantly, I told you so. He turned his no longer arrogant face toward me. I grinned at him with the broadest smile I could conjure, like a mule eating briars through a barbed wire fence, as the Texans would say. Speechless, the cameraman turned quickly and crawled off along the ditch toward the rear. Four or five marine tanks were parked close together in the valley downhill from us about one hundred yards away. Their heavily armored fronts faced up the valley to our left. The crewmen had been alerted by the first enemy round fired at the Amtrak. We saw them swinging their seventy-fives toward our left and closing their turret hatches. Not a moment too soon. The entire Japanese 47 millimeter gun battery opened rapid fire on the tanks. Too bad the movie cameraman had felt the call of duty summon him to the rear after the Amtrak exploded, because he missed a dramatic scene. The enemy guns fired with admirable accuracy. Several of their tracer-like armor-piercing shells hit the turrets of the tanks and ricocheted into the air. The tanks returned fire. In a few minutes the Japanese guns were knocked out or ceased firing, and everything got quiet. The tanks sustained only minor damage. We went back onto the road and moved on south without further incident. Until the island was secured on 21 June, we made a series of rapid moves southward, stopping only to fight groups of die-hard Japanese in caves, pillboxes, and ruined villages. The fresh 8th Marines pushed south rapidly. The 8th Marines going like a bat out of hell, a man said as news drifted back to us. We were fortunate in not suffering many casualties in the company. The Japanese were beaten, and the hope uppermost in every weary veteran's mind was that his luck would hold out a little longer until the end of the battle. We used loudspeakers captured Japanese soldiers and Okinawan civilians to persuade the remaining enemy to surrender. One sergeant and a Japanese lieutenant who had graduated from an Ivy League college and spoke perfect English gave themselves up in a road cut. Just after they came out and surrendered, a sniper opened fire on us. We eight or ten Marines took cover next to the embankment, but the Japanese officer and NCO stood in the middle of the road with the bullets kicking up dirt all around them. The sniper obviously was trying to kill them because they had surrendered. We looked at the two Japanese standing calmly, and one of our NCOs said, Get over here under cover, you dumb bastards. The enemy officer grinned affably and spoke to his NCO. They walked calmly over and got down as ordered. Some company came and shot the gun crew of a 150-millimeter howitzer emplaced in the mouth of a well-camouflaged cave. The Japanese defended their big artillery piece with their rifles and died to the last man. Farther on, we tried to get a group of enemy in a burial vault to surrender, but they refused. Our lieutenant, Mack, jumped in front of the door and shouted in Japanese, do not be afraid. Come out. I will not harm you. Then he fired a complete twenty-round magazine from his submachine gun into the door. We all just shook our heads and moved on. About a half hour later, the five or six Japanese rushed out fighting. Some of our Marines behind us killed them. Our battalion was one of the first American units to reach the end of the island. It was a beautiful sight even though there were still snipers around. We stood on a high hill overlooking the sea. Below to our left, we saw army infantry advancing toward us, flushing out and shooting down enemy soldiers singly and in small groups. Army 81-millimeter mortar fire kept pace ahead of the troops, and some of our weapons joined in coordination. 
We got a bit edgy when the Army mortar fire kept getting closer and closer to our positions, even after the unit had been appraised of our location. One of our battalion officers became furious as the big shells came dangerously close. He ordered a radio man to tell the Army officer in charge that if they didn't cease fire immediately, our 81s would open fire on his troops. The Army mortars stopped shooting. The night of 20 June, we made a defensive line on the high ground overlooking the sea. My mortar was dug in near a coral road and was to illuminate or fire HE on the area. Other guns of the section covered the seaward part of the company's sector. Earlier, we had seen and heard some sort of strange-looking rocket fired by the Japanese from over in our Army's sector. The projectiles were clearly visible as they went up with a terrible screaming sound. Most of them exploded in the 8th Marines area. The things sounded like bombs exploding. A call came for every available corpsman to help with casualties resulting from those explosions. The Japanese on Okinawa had a 320-millimeter spigot mortar unit equipped to fire a 675-pound shell. Americans first encountered this awesome weapon on Iwo Jima. I don't know whether what we saw fired several times during the last day or two on Okinawa was a spigot mortar, but whatever it was, it was a frightful-sounding weapon that caused great damage. The night turned into a long series of shooting scrapes with Japanese who prowled all over the place. We heard someone coming along the road, the coral crunching beneath his feet. In the pitch dark, a new replacement fired his carbine twice in that direction and yelled for the password. Somebody laughed, and several enemies started firing in our direction as they ran past us along the road. A bullet zipped by me and hit the hydrogen cylinder of a flamethrower placed on the side of the adjacent foxhole. The punctured cylinder emitted a sharp hissing sound. Is that thing going to blow up? I asked anxiously. Nah, just hit the hydrogen tank. It won't ignite, the flamethrower gunner said. We could hear the enemy soldiers' hop-nailed shoes pounding on the road until a fatal burst of fire from some other company K-Marine sent them sprawling. As we field-stripped them the next morning, I noted that each carried cooked rice in his double-boiler mess gear, all bullet-riddled then. Other Japanese swam or walked along in the sea just offshore. We saw them in the flare light. A line of Marines behind a stone wall on the beach fired at them. One of our men ran up from the wall to get more carbine ammo. Come on, sledgehammer. It's just like Lexington and Concord. No, thanks. I'm too comfortable in my hole. He went back down to the wall, and they continued firing throughout the night. Just before daylight, we heard a couple of enemy grenades explode. Japanese yelled and shouted wildly where one of our 37-millimeter guns was dug in across the road, covering the valley out front. Shots rang out, then desperate shouts and cursing. Corman! Then silence. A new corpsman who had joined us recently started toward the call for help, but I said, Hold it, Doc. I'll go with you. I wasn't being heroic. I was quite afraid. But knowing the enemy's propensity for treachery, I thought somebody should accompany him. As you were, Sledgehammer. You might be needed on the gun. Take off, Doc, and be careful, an NCO said. A few minutes later, he said, Okay, Sledgehammer, take off if you want to. I grabbed the Tommy and followed the corpsman. He was just finishing bandaging one of the wounded Marines of the 37-millimeter gun crew when I got there. Other Marines were coming over to see if they could help. Several men had been wounded by the firing when two enemy officers crept up the steep slope, threw grenades into the gun emplacement, and jumped in swinging their samurai sabers. One Marine had parried a saber blow with his carbine. His buddy then had shot the Japanese officer who fell backwards a short distance down the slope. 
The saber blow had severed a finger and sliced through the mahogany carbine forestock to the metal barrel. The second Japanese officer lay dead on his back next to the wheel of the 37 millimeter gun. He was in full dress uniform with white gloves, shiny leather leggings, Sam Brown belt, and campaign ribbons on his chest. Nothing remained of his head from the nose up, just a mass of crushed skull, brains, and bloody pulp. A grimy Marine with a dazed expression stood over the Japanese. With a foot planted firmly on the ground on each side of the enemy officer's body, the Marine held his rifle by the forestock with both hands and slowly and mechanically moved it up and down like a plunger. I winced each time it came down with a sickening sound into the gory mass. Brains and blood were splattered all over the Marine's rifle, boondockers, and canvas leggings, as well as the wheel of the 37-millimeter gun. The Marine was obviously in a complete state of shock. We gently took him by the arms. One of his uninjured buddies set aside the gore-smeared rifle. Let's get you out of here, Cobber. The poor guy responded like a sleepwalker as he was led off with the wounded, who were by then on stretchers. The man who had lost the finger clutched the Japanese saber in his other hand. I'm going to keep this bastard for a souvenir. We dragged the battered enemy officer to the edge of the gun emplacement and rolled him down the hill. Replete with violence, shock, blood, gore, and suffering, this was the type of incident that should be witnessed by anyone who has any delusions about the glory of war. It was as savage and as brutal as though the enemy and we were primitive barbarians rather than civilized men. Later in the day of 21 June 1945, we learned the high command had declared the island secured. We each received two fresh oranges with the compliments of Admiral Nimitz. So I ate mine, smoked my pipe, and looked out over the beautiful blue sea. The sun danced on the water. After 82 days and nights, I couldn't believe Okinawa had finally ended. I was tempted to relax and think that we would board ship immediately for rest and rehabilitation in Hawaii. That's what the scuttlebutt is, you guys. Straight dope. We're headed for Waikiki, a grinning buddy said. But long conditioning by the hardships that were our everyday diet in a rifle company made me skeptical. My intuition was borne out shortly. Get your gear on, check your weapons. We're moving back north in skirmish line. You people will mop up the area for any nips still holding out. You will bury all enemy dead. You will salvage U.S. and enemy equipment. All brass above 50 caliber in size will be collected and placed in neat piles. Stand by to move out. A Final Chore If this were a novel about war, or if I were a dramatic storyteller, I would find a romantic way to end this account while looking at that fine sunset off the cliffs at the southern end of Okinawa. But that wasn't the reality of what we faced. Company K had one more nasty job to do. To the battle-weary troops, exhausted after an 82-day campaign, mopping up was grim news. It was a nerve-wracking business at best. The enemy we encountered were the toughest of the diehards, selling their lives as expensively as possible. Fugitives from the law of averages, we were nervous and jittery. A man could survive Gloucester, Peleliu, and Okinawa, only to be shot by some fanatical bypassed Japanese holed up in a cave. It was hard for us to accept the order. But we did, grimly. Burying enemy dead and salvaging brass and equipment on the battlefield, however, was the last straw to our sagging morale. By the Lord, why the hell we gotta bury them stinking bastards after we killed them? 
Let them goddamn rear echelon people get a whiff of them. They didn't have to fight them. Geez, picking up brass. That's the most stupid, dumb jerk of a order I ever did hear of. Fighting was our duty, but burying enemy dead and cleaning up the battlefield wasn't for infantry troops, as we saw it. We complained and griped bitterly. It was the ultimate indignity to men who had fought so hard and so long and had won. We were infuriated and frustrated. For the first time, I saw several of my veteran comrades flatly refuse to obey an order. If some of us hadn't prevailed on them to knock off arguing hotly with an NCO, they would have been severely punished for insubordination. I'll never forget cajoling, arguing with, and begging two veteran buddies to be quiet and follow orders as I unstrapped my entrenching shovel from my pack. We stood wearily in a trampled cane field beside a bloated Jap corpse. Both buddies were three campaign men who were outstanding in combat, but had reached the end of their ropes. They weren't about to bury any stinking Japanese, no siree. I prevailed, however, just as Hank boys came over grim-faced and yelling at them to turn to. So we dragged ourselves back north in skirmish line. We cursed every dead enemy we had to bury. We just spaded dirt over them with our entrenching shovels. We cursed every cartridge case, above fifty caliber in size, we collected, to place in neat piles. Never before were we more thankful to have the support of our tanks. The flame tanks were particularly effective, and burning out troublesome Japanese in caves. The total number of Japanese killed by the five American divisions during the mop-up was 8,975, a large enough number of enemy to have waged intense guerrilla warfare if they hadn't been annihilated. Fortunately, we had few casualties. In a few days we assembled in an open field and fell out to await further orders. The weather was hot, so we all took off our packs, sat on our helmets, drank some water, and had a smoke. We were to be there for several hours, an NCO said, so we got the order to chow down. A friend and I went over to a little wooded area near the field to eat our K-rations in the shade. We walked into a completely untouched scene that resembled a natural park in a botanical garden. Low, graceful pines cast dense shade, and ferns and moss grew on the rocks and banks. It was cool, and the odor of fresh pine filled the air. Miraculously, it bore not a single sign of war. Boy, this is beautiful, isn't it, Sledgehammer? It looks unreal, I said as I took off my pack and sat down on the soft green moss beside a clump of graceful ferns. We each started heating a canteen cup of water for our instant coffee. I took out the prized can of cured ham I had obtained by trade from a man in the company CP. He had stolen it from an officer. We settled back in the cool silence. The war, military discipline, and other unpleasant realities seemed a million miles away. For the first time in months, we began to relax. Okay, you guys, move out. Move, move, out of here, an NCO said with authority ringing out in every word. Is the company moving out already? My friend asked in surprise. No, it isn't, but you guys are. Why? Because this is off limits to enlisted men the NCO said, turning and pointing to a group of officers munching their rations as they strolled into our newfound sanctuary. But we aren't in the way, I said. Move out and follow orders. To his credit, the NCO appeared in sympathy with us and seemed to feel the burden of his distasteful task. We sullenly picked up our half-cooked rations and our gear, went back out into the hot sun, and flopped down in the dusty field. Some crap, eh? Yeah, I said. We weren't even near those officers. 
The fighting on this goddamn island is over. The officers have started getting chicken again and throwing the crap around. Yesterday, while the shooting was still going on, it was all buddy-buddy with the enlisted men. Our grumblings were interrupted by the sound of a rifle shot. A Marine I knew very well reeled backward and fell to the ground. His buddy dropped his rifle and rushed to him, followed by several others. The boy was dead, shot in the head by his buddy. The other man had thought his rifle was unloaded when his young friend had stood over him and placed his thumb playfully over the muzzle. Pull the trigger, I bet it's not loaded. He pulled the trigger. The loaded rifle fired and set a bullet tearing up through the head of his best friend. Both had violated the cardinal rule. Don't point a weapon at anything you don't intend to shoot. Shock and dismay showed on the man's face from that moment until he left the company a few weeks later. He went, we heard, to stand a general court-martial and a probable prison term. But his worst punishment was living with the horror of having killed his best friend by playing with a loaded weapon. While the company was still sitting in the field, five or six men and I were told to get our gear and follow an NCO to waiting trucks. We were to go north to a site where our division would make a tent camp after the mop-up in the south was completed. Our job was to unload and guard some company gear. We were apprehensive about leaving the company, but it turned out to be good duty. During the long and dusty truck ride to the Motobu Peninsula, we rode past some areas we had fought through. By then, we could barely recognize them. They were transformed with roads, tent camps, and supply dumps. The number of service troops and the amount of equipment was beyond our belief. Roads that had been muddy tracks or coral-covered paths were highways with vehicles going to and fro, and MPs in neat khaki directing traffic. Tent camps, Quonset huts, and a huge parks of vehicles lay along our route. We had come back to civilization. We had climbed up out of the abyss once more. It was exhilarating. We sang and whistled like little boys until our sides were sore. As we went north, the countryside became beautiful. Most of it seemed untouched by the war. Finally, our truck turned off into a potato field not far from high rocky cliffs overlooking the sea and a small island which our driver said was Ishima. The land around our future campsite was undamaged. We unloaded the company gear from the truck. The driver had picked up five-gallon cans of water for us. Plenty of K-rations had been issued. We set up a bivouac. Corporal Vincent was in charge, and we were glad of it. He was a great guy and a Company K veteran. Our little guard detail spent several quiet, carefree days basking in the sun by day and mounting one sentry guard duty at night. We were like boys in a campout. The fear and terror were behind us. Our battalion came north a few days later. All hands went to work in earnest to complete the tent camp. Pyramidal tents were set up, drainage ditches were dug, folding cots and bedrolls were brought to us, and a canvas-roofed mess hall was built. Every day old friends returned from the hospitals, some hale and hearty, but others showing the effects of only partial recovery from severe wounds. To our disgust, rumors of rehabilitation in Hawaii faded, but our relief that the long Okinawa ordeal was over at last was indescribable. Very few familiar faces were left. Only twenty-six Peleliu veterans who had landed with the company on one April remained, and I doubt there were even ten of the old hands who had escaped being wounded at one time or another on Peleliu or Okinawa. Total American casualties were 7,613 killed and missing, and 31,807 wounded in action. Neuropsychiatric, non-battle casualties, amounted to 26,221, probably higher than in any other previous Pacific theater battle. 
This latter high figure is attributed to two causes. The Japanese poured under U.S. troops the heaviest concentrations of artillery and mortar fire experienced in the Pacific, and the prolonged close-in fighting with a fanatical enemy. Marines and attached naval medical personnel suffered total casualties of 20,020 killed, wounded, and missing. Japanese casualty figures are hazy. However, 107,539 enemy dead were counted on Okinawa. Approximately 10,000 enemy troops surrendered, and about 20,000 were either sealed in caves or buried by the Japanese themselves. Even lacking an exact accounting, in the final analysis, the enemy garrison was, with rare exceptions, annihilated. Unfortunately, approximately 42,000 Okinawan civilians caught between the two opposing armies perished from artillery fire and bombing. The 1st Marine Division suffered heavy casualties on Okinawa. Officially, it lost 7,665 men killed, wounded, and missing. There were also an undetermined number of casualties among the replacements, whose names never got on a muster roll. Considering that most of the casualties were in the division's three infantry regiments, about 3,000 strength in each, it's obvious that the rifle companies took the bulk of the beating, just as they had on Peleliu. The division's losses of 6,526 on Peleliu and 7,665 on Okinawa total 14,191. Statistically, the infantry units had suffered over 150% losses through two campaigns. The few men like me who never got hit can claim with justification that we survived the abyss of war as fugitives from the law of averages. The 1st Marine Division received the Presidential Unit Citation for its part in the Okinawa Campaign. It was over. As we finished building our tent camp, we began trying to unwind from the grueling campaign. Some of the Cape Gloucester veterans rotated home almost immediately, and replacements arrived. Ugly rumors circulated that we would hit Japan next, with an expected casualty figure of one million Americans. No one wanted to talk about that. On 8 August, we heard that the first atomic bomb had been dropped on Japan. Reports abounded for a week about a possible surrender. Then, on 15 August 1945, the war ended. We received the news with quiet disbelief, coupled with an indescribable sense of relief. We thought the Japanese would never surrender. Many refused to believe it. Sitting in stunned silence, we remembered our dead. So many dead. So many maimed. So many bright futures consigned to the ashes of the past. So many dreams lost in the madness that had engulfed us. Except for a few widely scattered shouts of joy, the survivors of the abyss sat hollow-eyed and silent, trying to comprehend a world without war. In September, the 1st Marine Division went to North China on occupation duty, the 5th Marines to the fascinating ancient city of Peking. After about four and a half months there, I rotated stateside. My happiness knew no bounds when I learned I was slated to ship home, it was time to say goodbye to old buddies in K-3-5. Severing the ties formed in two campaigns was painful. One of America's finest and most famous elite fighting divisions had been my home during a period of the most extreme adversity. Up there on the line, with nothing between us and the enemy but space, and precious little of that, we'd forged a bond that time would never erase. We were brothers. I left with a sense of loss and sadness, but K-3-5 will always be a part of me. It's ironic 
that the record of our company was so outstanding, but that so few individuals were decorated for bravery. Uncommon valor was displayed so often it went largely unnoticed. It was expected, but nearly every man in the company was awarded the Purple Heart. My good fortune in being one of the few exceptions continues to amaze me. War is brutish, inglorious, and a terrible waste. Combat leaves an indelible mark on those who are forced to endure it. The only redeeming factors were my comrades' incredible bravery and their devotion to each other. Marine Corps training taught us to kill efficiently and to try to survive, but it also taught us loyalty to each other and love. That esprit de corps sustained us. Until the millennium arrives and countries cease trying to enslave others, it will be necessary to accept one's responsibilities and to be willing to make sacrifices for one's country, as my comrades did. As the troops used to say, if the country is good enough to live in, it's good enough to fight for. With privilege goes responsibility. The End You have been listening to With the Old Breed by E.B. Sledge, narrated by George Wilson. If you've enjoyed this book and this performance, Recorded Books recommends We Were Soldiers Once and Young by Lieutenant General Harold G. Moore and Joseph L. Galloway, narrated by Johnny Heller, and Helmet for My Pillow by Robert Leckie, narrated by Tom West. You'll find a wide selection of titles in the Recorded Books catalog, including bestsellers, mysteries, classics, histories, and more. So to order another recorded book, or for a copy of our latest listing, please call us using the toll-free number found on the back of the book. You can order by phone with any major credit card, or by writing to us, or by faxing us. Don't forget to ask about easy 30-day rentals by mail. On our website, you can browse the catalog, hear about the latest releases, place orders, or tune into narrator profiles and author interviews, so visit us there at www.recordedbooks.com. And thank you for being a Recorded Books reader.